I'm uh, Adrian Albert. This is a uh, joint work with um, uh, colleagues from MIT, Marta Gonzalez and uh, Jasmine Carr from Phillips Research. And this uh, is a project in which we uh, ask the question, how do you compare uh, regions, local regions, local environments within cities uh, using modern uh, computer vision methods such as convolutional neural networks and uh, satellite imagery? So uh, the data and uh, code is available at the GitHub repository over there. But let me just uh, dive right into it. So the, really the question that we started off with was how do you do um, sort of more intelligent energy and uh, uh, infrastructure benchmarking, so for buildings? How do you do that? Um, keeping in mind that buildings are really not isolated entities. They actually interact with, uh, they're embedded in energy storage infrastructure in the, in the city, and um, they're surrounded by other buildings, by transportation and mobility on roads and vegetation, et cetera. So uh, that actually prompted us to, to the question, how do you compare uh, various areas of the city in a very, say, uh, immediate, uh, quick, cheap, large-scale manner? And that turns out to have a, an actual uh, effect or an actual impact. Uh, different areas of the city are actually very different, and the, uh, the, these differences in density of population, density of the built environment, have a material impact on, say, the energy use of, a, uh, uh, of, uh, of the local sort of area within that city. For every uh, uh, degree increase in the temperature, um, uh, within a local environment, uh, we observe about a 1.5 to 2 percent uh, increase in the energy used for cooling in the summer, which has a material effect on uh, the, the energy demand within uh, the city. And so, and this is really just um, an effect of uh, the locality of uh, various physical features, uh, such as uh, the buildings and the trees and the, uh, uh, the roads. Uh, denser areas are just hotter in the summer than uh, less dense areas. So this uh, essentially prompted us, prompted us the, to, to, to arrive at the question, how do you compare um, various areas within cities in a sort of consistent and rapid way? Uh, this problem is also you, known as land use classification. Uh, this is a time-tested or time-honored uh, problem. It's been uh, studied for decades, uh, so there's really a lot of uh, interest in this, uh, in this problem in, in the remote sensing and the uh, uh, geography and urban planning community. The uh, applications are numerous. Uh, I'll just remind uh, you of a few. So zoning, uh, it's used in zoning and permitting and building of new constructions. Um, traditionally, this is done by uh, cities, for example, commissioning large-scale surveys uh, or even small-scale scale surveys. Uh, these surveys typically are quite uh, labor intensive, they're expensive, they take a while to, to perform, uh, they, require, uh, they require expert labor. So one first question that we asked uh, uh, when we arrived at this problem was how do you uh, do this when you don't have this much labor and this much resources at your disposal? How do you do this in a cheap way uh, and hopefully automated way? And to what extent can we do that? Uh, what's the quality of the product that comes out? So now this, the other question that uh, uh, we got to, uh, as we were thinking through this, was, well, uh, now that, uh, suppose we had some models that allowed us to do this uh, land use classification in a way that we desire, such as uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with some level of uh, confidence or accuracy and rapidly and cheaply, can we use it for something else? And in particular, can we use it for, uh, at least to take a step into the direction of, uh, of our of the initial problem that we started off with, the that of energy benchmarking or comparing environments within cities from a, uh, a functional perspective. And so to our aid come two trends. Uh, first of all, uh, nowadays there's a lot more data on the built infrastructures, in, in particular satellite data, remote sensing data. The, um, this explosion has been really driven by the, the emergence of uh, several or a number of these uh, startups uh, that essentially put Android phones, uh, sensors from smartphones into shoeboxes and shoot them up into space. And all that costs a lot less than it used to, uh, used to be the case, about a factor of a 1,000. And so to, to that, you add the emergence of better algorithm computing. And obviously, I don't have to preach to this crowd about uh, the new 
types of uh, vision models uh, powered by neural networks and uh, various types of uh, frameworks that have emerged, uh, one every you know few months or so, uh, for processing these uh, these types of data and these types of models. So really, I wanted to, to mention the uh, uh, the gaps that I see in, in in between these two communities. On the one hand, we have the urban uh, planning, GIS, and remote sensing communities. Uh, that have been traditionally talking to each other and developing uh, sort of tools and uh, a common understanding. And on the other hand, we have the machine learning and computer vision communities, which typically or traditionally have focused more on things like telling cats for, you know, apart from dogs. And so uh, these communities don't typically uh, overlap all that much. And so there's a really a need of uh, uh, two needs that I, that I see in this space. One is that of uh, a better, larger, uh, more consistent uh, uh, labeled data set and data sets and tools. So there is, for example, no image equivalent in the remote sensing community uh, for satellite imagery. And so that also is because uh, gathering this kind of data requires uh, painstaking labor or expert knowledge, which is really not uh, the case for other vision domains such as uh, natural images. So that requires really uh, thinking uh, about how do you develop specialized architectures uh, and models for de dealing with the caveats of satellite imagery. For example, remote sensing data is very uh, different from, uh, from the cats and dogs example. Uh, it really uh, consists of small objects that may or may not be rotated into space, but it's still the same building. Uh, it's multispectral, so there's all sorts of information that is not typically available in, in RGB type images. It has a wide range of spatial scales, etc. So, and all of that has made made it uh, uh, or very difficult for these communities to to overlap to the extent that uh, I think they should. For example, if you go to Stack Exchange and Geographic Information Systems and you look for convolutional neural networks, and this is a search I did a few days ago, you find you find exactly two entries or two questions, and uh, I think uh, uh, this is kind of illustrative of uh, the situation right now. But obviously, things are improving. There was another one or two papers in KDD uh, around the general topic of remote sensing and climate change, uh, or uh, climate, climate science, science type, uh, type research. And so let me just get to the outline of my talk. Uh, I'll first discuss a, um, a, an effort that we're um, uh, undergoing right now to put together uh, what I call the urban environments data set, essentially for cost conscious uh, GIS and remote sensing um, with, uh, for, for machine learning. Uh, I'll describe some experiments we did to compare uh, various urban environments, <laughs> sorry, uh, very, various urban environments within uh, this data set. There's something. OK, all right. And, um, uh, and then I'll, I'll discuss a few more experiments we did um, to essentially assess the performance of you know, training one model or a model in one location and trying to apply it to a different geographical location. And what's, what are the limitations of, of that procedure? So first about the data. Uh, we intend this to be a, a benchmark data for, for the machine learning community, but the um, uh, question that that, um, that, that uh, gets him uh, or first onto one's mind is whether there is anything out there uh, that's uh, kind of similar. And the question is, yes, there is, uh, there is one data set that we made uh, heavy use of in this uh, research uh, called the Deep South data, uh, essentially uh, six land use classes, um, buildings, uh, barren land, uh, et cetera. So th this is a data set that's focused a lot more on the physical uh, components of the uh, uh, the different uh, uh, locations in the city, as opposed to the functional um, uh, use of that land as assigned by the subjective uh, opinion of an expert, such as an urban planner. And this is what we're, we're trying to address. And so uh, the way we put together this, uh, this data set is really in um, uh, to, to follow a supervised learning kind of approach or to enable supervised learning kind of um, uh, kind of modeling, and uh, for this you'd need essentially samples and labels. Uh, the samples are images, uh, satellite images. Labels are uh, hopefully uh, high quality labels that uh, uh, assign a class or land use class to that particular uh, particular image. So for the labels uh, itself, for the labels themselves, 
one uh, good source of lab uh, labels that we, we found uh, was actually a large-scale survey conducted by the European uh, Union, uh, about 300 cities across Europe, uh, about 20 land use classes, and these are importantly consistent classes. Essentially, um, the European Union has made sure that uh, all of these major European cities are uh, labeled in a consistent fashion. It's, it's been a, a major effort in the EU. So we took that geometric data, GIS data, and we paired it with uh, imagery from uh, our favorite uh, imagery source, Google Maps. And for that, we developed a, a suite of an ecosystem of tools. Uh, there's a couple of packages in Python that are online. Uh, they're pretty experimental at this point, but uh, I encourage you to, to go uh, uh, and play, go online and play with them. Uh, PySat ML uh, deals with uh, integrating raster and geometric data uh, for specific machine learning tasks. And the other package is uh, really just a bunch of wrappers around typical APIs uh, for uh, commercial uh, sources of satellite imagery, such as Google Maps and another one, Planet Labs. But you, you obviously need the API keys to, to work with that. And so now that we have a way to, to collect this data set, um, let, let's try to, to say um, uh, set up an analysis in which the intuition is that land use classes are just really a useful uh, discretization of a more continuous spectrum of uh, the function of urban form and uh, how land is being actually used in, um, uh, in cities. And so uh, an example of the um, uh, data set that we uh, put together is, is here on the right, on the, I'm sorry, on the left hand side there's uh, a map of an example city, such as uh, I think it's Vienna. Uh, each color represents a different land use class. Uh, we have uh, the Danube River over there in blue. Uh, green areas are parks, uh, etc. And so, uh, to each of these uh, um, uh, land use uh, locations, let's say, uh, you can associate an image from uh, from satellite uh, provider. Uh, I have ten. Um, uh, example or ten classes uh, of uh, of land use uh, of land use here on the on the right here on the image, uh, such as um, water bodies, medium high, low residential areas, uh, etc. And you can see that the, there is a lot of variation within these images, but they're also pretty uh, hard to tell apart for for the unaided eye. Even a human can't really tell wh whether a this is a medium density area or a high density area or whether this is a commercial area, etc. So it's uh, it's actually uh, it requires it does require a fair amount of uh, uh, of effort or uh, expert knowledge. And so one other uh, um, problem or challenge really is that these labels are these land use classes are quite imbalanced, and so. Uh, there's a lot more agricultural land and airports, uh, et cetera. So your trading algorithm has to take that into account. And so I'll, I'll actually skip over this. Uh, you can read it in the paper how we sampled uh, this data set to make sure that uh, uh, we take into account this balancing uh, effect. And so I encourage you to read the paper. I'll just mention that um, the training of the models is actually quite standard. We use two um, vision data sets out there, uh, uh, vision models out there that are um, uh, quite uh, quite uh, uh, regarded as benchmarks. So the VGG 16 and the ResNet 50, um, they, they are pretty good in terms of um, uh, uh, classification performance on other data sets. So what we did was take these architectures and compare them, first pre-train them on the DeepSat data, and then finally uh, uh, further fine-tune them on the urban environments data set to predict 10 line use classes. And then uh, we created essentially raster uh, uh, land use maps for cities using uh, the, tra the train model and uh, satellite imagery. And so we obtained such uh, images like, uh, like the one I, I'm showing uh, on, the, on the side here. The top row shows the grand uh, truth raster uh, uh, land use map for six cities in Europe. Uh, middle row shows essentially the situation where you trade on one location and predict on the same location. So train on some data from Barcelona, for example, and predict on, uh, on another set of data from Barcelona. The bottom row shows the, the situation where you train on everywhere else. Uh, so your model is trained on a different location or a different geographical location, and you try to predict on, say, uh, say Budapest. So you train on everything else but Budapest and try to predict on Budapest. And as you can see, the quality kind of drops with this uh, when you go from uh, one geography to the other. And the question is why? Um, but first, let, let's try, that now that we have a model that is trained, 
uh, let's try to use it for some interesting qualitative analysis. And we did a uh, simple TSNE projection, so low dimensional embedding projection of uh, a number of um, uh, urban environments in this data set. So each, each dot represents a location or a 200 by 50, 250 by 250 meter uh, uh, essentially square uh, in, in different cities. And we have uh, colored them by the land use map. And you can see things, uh, uh, interesting things like, um, well, it, the uh, water bodies are essentially well separated. For Barcelona, the water bodies are kind of embedded within the parks. Uh, so maybe they're more similar, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you can start to, uh, reading off these charts um, also as a tool for uh, a, an initial qualitative comparison between various cities. So what's the distance between parks in Barcelona and parks in Madrid? And are parks in, Ma in Madrid more similar to those in uh, Barcelona than, than those in Budapest, uh, et cetera? So more quantitative results are, are shown here. Essentially, this is the situation where, where we ask, uh, well, uh, if I train my model on a city A, how well does it do on, a, on, the, C, on the city B? Uh, the diagonal there shows, uh, which is higher numbers, higher accuracy numbers, um, shows that obviously when you train it on the same uh, city that you're trying to predict, uh, the model performs better. But uh, there is some interesting uh, patterns here that you uh, you might observe if you look at say Barcelona, say Barcelona. You train your model in Barcelona and you try to predict on Athens, you get better performance than if you train your model in Barcelona and try to predict on uh, Budapest or Berlin. And there may be various types of architectural, cultural factors uh, why that is the case. Um, you know, Barcelona and uh, Athens are both fairly warm countries with a, a certain, um, say, uh, proximity to the Mediterranean, so certain, certain climate. And so, and more details are in the paper on how um, various um, various um, uh, areas within cities differ from one another with respect to land use, their, their land use class. And so, I encourage you to go there and uh, and read some more. And uh, we observe that this these kinds of patterns or these kinds of uh, d discrepancies do preserve at different spatial scales that we we study. And so, I'll, I'll conclude with one. Uh, uh, application that we, we did uh, now that we have some trained models. So essentially we have models that understand urban form for, from the perspective of a, uh, uh, an urban planner, what, what an urban planner might say about a particular area of a city. So uh, what we did was to take the model, um, extract uh, a bunch of features from, from that model given a input image. So you have a query image. Your question is how can I find uh, or can I find images uh, similar to that image from across my data set. And so uh, you, you expand that, fe that image in a uh, feature space. You use, uh, we use a, uh, a simple uh, KNUS neighbor classifier to find uh, the closest uh, uh, images within a, that, per that uh, image feature space. And that's, this is what we get. If you look at, say, Athens, water bodies, uh, the, uh, the, the query image is denoted by the as the, as the one on, on the left, and then the two more uh, images on, say, that water bodies column are the ones that are given by the algorithm as the most proximal images, and there are also of, of um, port areas, uh, et cetera. So this is what we call an urban engine, uh, or a search engine for urban environments, uh, which is, a, I, I think, a, an exciting area of, uh, of, of uh, further work uh, right now, because it will enable, uh, essentially, applications of uh, uh, more uh, more targeted applications in uh, benchmarking and the comparison of, uh, of urban environments in a quantitative way. And so for next steps and questions, we plan to further curate uh, our data set and uh, some of it is available on the GitHub repository and uh, hopefully we'll be able to release a more uh, well curated data set for the community. Uh, a, a higher uh, understanding or higher level understanding uh, is possible with this model, but maybe uh, going to lower level sort of physical uh, features uh, such as vegetation, buildings, so the composition of those environments is also important, uh, especially when you talk about uh, the, um, the impact to uh, local climate zones and uh, uh, building energy efficiency. And so uh, the third area of, of uh, research for this would be uh, well, now you can say uh, recover land use maps from uh, from a satellite imagery. What else can you recover? Can you recover a more physical sort of variables uh, 
uh, that affect uh, the functioning of a city or the functioning of buildings? Um, can you build thematic maps from space? And that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you all for, for, uh, for holding on.